trainer Loren here. And trainer David. So today's topic of discussion is going to be the Medicare supplement and basically Part D. They kind of go together. I, I think so. I mean, even though the supplement is, you know, not part of uh, the Medicare plans like Part D is, but you can't, you're going to need one if you have a supplement. Yes. Let's look at it that way. So why a Medicare supplement? A Medicare supplement insurance, Medigap, is a policy that is going to help pay for some of the health care costs that original Medicare doesn't cover, like, you know, those co-payments, co-insurance, deductibles. It's also going to give protection against the out-of-pocket costs, which is going to help your insured focus on getting better. And then it also gives them the flexibility to see any doctor or go to any hospital with no waiting periods. Now, please keep in mind, this does not provide standalone coverage. It requires an enrollment in a Medicare Part A and B, does not provide a prescription drug benefit, does not provide benefits for vision, dental care, hearing aids, eyeglasses, prescription sunglasses, or private duty nursing. I'm hearing a lot of opportunities for other sales with this. I would agree with you, David. And then please note that this does not duplicate a benefit paid for by Medicare. Well, let's kind of take a closer look at what it does do. We have, uh, you know, it's going to cover, you have to have that A and B. And then as the name implies, it's going to supplement A and B. So uh, you'll see that there's four plans across the top there. Uh, we don't usually sell that supplement to A. It's just Medicare has a requirement that if you sell any plans, you have to make plan A available. Uh, most people are going to go with plan F or plan G, and a few will like that plan M. Uh, let's look at how it works with Part A. Part A had that $1,364 deductible uh, for your hospital stay, and that is not a annual deductible that is an event deductible so that can happen how many times david kind of a worst case about four times in one year ouch that's a lot of money that's yeah that's a lot uh but uh, that, that first 60 days is covered by um the, the 164 deductible and then after that it goes to a, a daily rate okay uh, by day 61 it goes to 341 dollars a day until 90 and from 90 out to, to 150, it's at $682 per day. But I want to call your attention to those plan F, G, and N all cover that. So there would be no Part A deductible or Part A coinsurance with uh, one of these supplements. So that 1346 wouldn't be existent? It would not. Nice. Okay. The other thing about Part A is it covers blood. Now, Medicare itself does not cover that first three pints of blood. And you may be surprised to know that most procedures take three pints or less. And so you're going to be on the hook for all the blood. Uh, but with the Medicare supplement, it does cover that first three pints of blood. Hospice care, Medicare fully covers hospice care. So the supplement isn't really contributing in that, that area. Uh, but in skilled nursing care, again, we find that Medicare covers that first 20 days, but after that, the cost goes to $170.50 per day uh, would be the coinsurance that uh, a Medicare recipient would have to pay. So if you have your Medicare supplement, that is fully covered. Now let's look at Part B. Part B is your you know, your doctor visits, your lab work, your medical supplies. Uh, Part B has a deductible of $185. Um, that was what they were talking about, is one of the reasons was that first elimination, uh, first dollar elimination is the uh, plan F will no longer be available to new uh, Medicare uh, enrollees uh, starting on uh, January 1st of 2020. Uh, but that was the only one that covered uh, the full 185 deductible. The uh, other plans left you with the deductible. Part B coinsurance. Uh, that's Medicare is going to pay 80% of the cost of the you know like the doctor visit, and leaving you with 20. And in Medicare, 
that 20% is due at time of service. So to keep the numbers simple, if you saw a doctor and they charged you 100, uh, your share would be 20. And that would be due at time of service. And likewise, if you needed a surgery and it was $100,000, they would want your 20,000 at time of service. Well, uh, all those Medicare supplements, they cover that 20%. Excess charges. Now, in Medicare, uh, for all those billing codes, the doctor is allowed to charge an additional 15%. At the, it's capped at that, but they're allowed to have that 15% resulting in balanced billing for many people. Then with uh, your Medicare supplement, uh, that's going to be covered except for Plan N. Plan N doesn't cover that. And as we had talked about the blood, that's uh, already going to be covered. Home health care. Now, Medicare itself fully funded home health care, so the supplement didn't truly help with that part, but durable medical equipment. Uh, now we're talking, uh, you needed that wheelchair, or you needed that CPAP machine, or you needed help with that, all those diabetic supplies. Okay. Um, again, once you've met your Part B deductible, you're into the 20% coinsurance, and your Medicare supplement will cover the uh, the balance of, of that cost for you. And one of the things that uh, is a real benefit that you get with the supplement is this uh, emergency care outside of the U.S. For those who didn't know, Medicare itself does not cover uh, any of us uh, U.S. citizens outside of the United States or a U.S. territory. So if regardless, if you are a citizen of New of the United States or not, Medicare is not going to cover you if you go outside. So if you have an accident, even in the event of an emergency, it's not going to be covered? It is not covered. Not oh if you have a supplement, uh, you do pick that up. Okay, so uh, the way that the Medicare supplement works is it does have a $250 annual deductible uh, per calendar year for outside of uh, the U.S. It'll then pay... Uh, you know, the 80, it will pay 80%, leaving you with 20% of the bill, uh, up to $50,000. So there is a, uh, you know, a cap on there. But the idea is really that uh, if you're outside the U.S. and you're injured, you get your emergency handled and return to the U.S. for, uh, for treatment. So who's eligible for these plans? So people that have currently... A and B that are active at the time of enrollment, the member has to be ages 65 and older and have to have a Medicare eligibility due to a disability in a state requiring under the age of 65. Now, just to clarify, please, um, just because you have, have social security disability does not mean that your state automatically has a MedSup plan. So please pay attention to the state and region because not all states offer a med set for those that are on social security disability. So let's get into this Medicare Part D, shall we, David? Let's talk a bit about that because that's going to pair nicely with this uh, med set. Yes. So the introduction, what is Part D? Question and answers and then of course the wrap-up is what's on the agenda so medicare program has four parts so we have the medicare part a which is the coverage for inpatient hospital care part b which is the coverage for doctor services and outpatient hospital care part c which is the privatized coverage that replaces part a and b so it's basically the private care Carriers providing Medicare health care plans. United Healthcare, Aetna, one of those. Like yeah. yeah. And then it's called a Medicare Advantage plan. So again, as David is saying, they have to be approved. Like United has various products that are Medicare Advantage. Now keep in mind, not all carriers sell the Medicare Advantage plans. And then we have the Part D, which is the privatized person prescription drug coverage allows Medicare beneficiaries to obtain prescription drug coverage from health carriers through a variety of plans. 
Now remember, the Medicare Part D is the newest addition to the Medicare program, which its inception was January 1 of 2006. Boy, they're quick to add to this program, aren't they, David? So people that are under, or excuse me, at the age of 65 and above, people receiving social security disability income, that SSDI, beginning in their 25th month, people with end-stage renal disease, ESRD, people in a few other scenarios, for example, Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS, and then we have the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, and also known as CMS. So these are the government body that regulates the Medicare programs, beneficiaries, and the health carriers who offer the various forms of Medicare health care coverage. And then they also publish the CMS marketing guidelines, the fundamental document to ensure that Medicare beneficiaries are provided with accurate information. David and I were talking to a group of people last week and we highly recommended this because it gave them the guidelines as to what they could and couldn't do as a Medicare agent, correct David? It does and um, those are, there's quite a few rules in there. I know we all know that no soliciting, but there's a, quite a few others that it goes with it. Yes. Forms of prescription drug coverage. Well, you can get your prescription drug coverage a couple of different ways. So um, you can have that Medicare Advantage plan with prescription drug coverage. And that was the one that was known as Part C, that combined Part A uh, and B with drug coverage for Part D. But since we're kind of following the supplement, uh, this one, we're going to be looking at the standalone Part D plan. Okay, They all work the same, whether it's included, uh, with your, uh, you know, MA plan, or is it a standalone Part D? It's strictly going to be for the prescriptions. There's no medical coverage included in there, and it pairs up. Uh, and this is one of those uh, keywords and tricky phrases. For Part D, it's you have to have Medicare and or A and or B, right? You don't have to have both of them. You can have just A, just B, or both but you have to have one of those to get the uh, prescription drug claim. Now we need a little bit of a common vocabulary to kind of uh, talk about prescription drugs. So I'm gonna go over a few terms. Most of them are the same as under 65, but just to make sure that we all uh, know what we're talking about. Is uh, first uh, in Medicare, we call it the formulary, a uh, fancy name for a list of covered drugs. Premium, the premium, uh, you know, they vary from plan to plan. And uh, Part D enrollees with higher incomes will pay a, a higher amount. They call that the Income Related Monthly Adjustment Amount, or IRMA for short. But the, the premium is that monthly payment. Uh, deductibles, just like in under 65, that's the part that the individual has to pay before the insurance company starts paying. Co-pays and co-insurance. But you'll see that um, it's usually uh, in, by the tier levels, Medicare uh, requires four tiers, but I've seen five and six in some of the other plans um, and some of the, you know, of the Part D plans. And it typically follows you know, tier one and two with uh, tier are, are generic with tier one being preferred and tier two being simply generic, tier three being name brand drugs, tier four being non-preferred drugs, but still covered by the plan. They're just on the non-preferred list, and it's a little bit more expensive. And tier five, which are specialty drugs. And then tier six, if you see them, we'll be talking about the gap, and we'll be talking, you know, how, uh, what their cost will be in the gap uh, under tier six. There'll be a special category, and we'll talk more on the gap or the donut hole here in a moment. Uh, there'll be like a copay pays can be uh, our coinsurance. Always look at a copay as a set amount, and coinsurance is a percentage of the amount. Pharmacy networks. You're going to fall under, uh, you know, preferred and standard. Preferred will be the place where your customer will get the lowest cost uh, with that particular plan. 
Uh, they're usually tiered up or uh, you know paired up, like CVS and Aetna go together, uh, Walgreens and uh, United Healthcare go together. But you, you'll want to be sure that you know which one's preferred and which one's standard. Now you can go to either one, but you will pay a little bit more at the standard pharmacy versus uh, the preferred pharmacy. Most of these plans will have mail order, uh, especially when dealing with customers who are a little more on the low income side. It's usually good to point out because many of those will provide, uh, the Part D plans will provide 90 day uh, worth of prescriptions for tier one and tier two at zero cost. So take a look at that mail order options when available. Now some limitations on drug coverage, and these are the cost utilization measures. When you look up a drug for one of your Medicare um, uh, customers, if you see any of these little terms out there, QL, quantity limits, PA, prior authorization, or ST, meaning step therapy, uh, you're going to want your customer to know what that means and how it's going to affect them. Uh, quantity limits, mostly seen on the, any of the opiates, especially these days, uh, where they may only be seven to 10 days worth at a time. Uh, that, that's all they can get. Then there's uh, the prior authorization. And with that one, I usually encourage people not to wait until that last moment uh, to fill that prescription. Those could be 28 to 48 hours before they will uh, provide a prescription there at the pharmacy. We've got to get permission back from the insurance company. And then there's step therapy. You'll see that on very expensive drugs that are covered in the formulary where the uh, uh, insurance company is going to require that your customer and doctor work together to try less expensive alternatives uh, before they'll cover that more expensive drug, even if it is in their formulary. Uh, one last little note on formularies is there, there's some rules that it helps to understand, is that for every therapeutic category of drug, there must be two in the formulary. So for those that have, uh, you know, uh, certain types of thing, uh, you know, needs, um, I always like to use insulin. It's always a good requirement. There's probably a half dozen different uh, insulins out there, but they're all name brand. And the insurance company, by that rule, is only required to have two of them on the list. So you can see how uh, those formularies, the richer the formulary, if they had that one that had all six, it might have a much higher premium than the one that only covered the two. And then the coverage gap. Uh, some plans do offer lower payment copays while in the in the donut hole, uh, and we're going to really break that down and see how that works. So what we're going to look at here is uh, what's called the uh, the, the standard. Uh, benefit and, and that all the implants must adhere to at least this outline. They can be better than this, but they can't be anything less than what's covered here. And you'll see what I mean. Um, there's a de deductible. Medicare's deductible is $415. The plan can have a lower deductible, but it could not have a higher deductible. So you can make it better, but this is the outline of what they must do the initial coverage limit. Now, CMS is going to track that true cost of medications. This is not what your customer paid. This is what the actual drug cost. So you could have a drug that costs several hundred dollars that the customer is making a, you know, a 25% uh, copay on. So they're going to be tracking that full price. So that's that initial coverage limit goes up to 3000 $820. That's where the gap begins because under initial coverage, your customer was paying 25% of the cost of the drug, whether it was generic or name brand. In the gap, the cost coverage changed. Okay, And while in the gap, if it was a name brand, it's 25%, but if it's a generic, it's 37%. As they continue to track though that true out of pocket, uh, when it reaches $5,100, a couple of different things happen. Uh, your, 
you're into the catastrophic coverage, and depending upon your income and whether you have subsidies, uh, exactly how you're going to be treated uh, can vary. Uh, for the standard benefit, where for most people, they're going to pay the greater of 5% of the cost or $3.40 uh, for a generic or preferred drug, and then the greater of 5% uh, or $8.50 for all other drugs. So look at that as tiers one, two, and three would be the 5% or $3.40, and tiers four and five is gonna be that 5% or $8.50. Now, if they're one of the low income uh, certified people, you'll find that the 5% uh, requirement has gone away and theirs will be a lot lower. So I'm gonna give you a kind of another picture to look at this and this graphic kind of gives you that donut appearance and so during the first stage uh, you tell you reach your deductible you're paying hundred percent then you're paying 25 percent for your prescriptions until it reaches that true out-of-pocket of, of 3,820 now you're in the gap 25 percent for brand name drugs 37 percent for generics until true out-of-pocket reaches $5,100 and then in stage four, things change kind of depending upon your, um, your status. So let's kind of break that down a little bit on those statuses. So we have the extra help, also known as the low income subsidy. So LIS is a federal program administered by the Social Security Administration, also known as the SSA, for Medicare consumers who have limited income and resources. So please note, all of these people are automatically enrolled in the Medicaid for this particular plan. But if you have an insured that you think may qualify, it's always good that you apply for it. And you would help them a great deal because if they qualify, they're going to be getting assistance with their monthly premium or their yearly deductible, prescription co-insurance or co payments it could eliminate the part d late penalty it because they enrolled late or um provides coverage in that coverage gap or that donut hole that david was just talking about so you'll see here that with the assistance to cover prescription drugs low-income subsidy co-payments is a full benefit dual eligible now with the dual eligible you can also hear them being referred to as a Medi Medi or the dual eligible or LIS. So don't let that fool you, but this is for the institutionalized or persons receiving home and or community based services. So that HCBS, you'll note that it says zero dollar. Please note, David and I stress do not ever tell an insured it's no cost or what was the other one we heard david don't say free that's it so you always have to say a zero dollar payment or what was the other one or, or zero dollar copay yeah. zero dollar copay so never ever ever tell them it's free or it's no cost to you we can't stress that enough that's where we've seen some agents get in trouble right david yeah that's that abc always yeah. be compliant so the full benefit dual eligible with incomes equal or less than 100% of the federal poverty levels on a generic or a preferred drug can have a copay of up to $1.25 per prescription, or the other is up to $3.70 per prescription. And then the above catastrophic limit can be, again, a $0 copay. For that full benefit dual with incomes less, um, or excuse, greater than, greater than excuse me, um, 100% of the federal poverty level or other full subsidy eligible beneficiaries, again, can have a $0 deductible, a generic preferred drugs up to $3.35 per prescription, other can be up to $8.35 per prescription, and the above catastrophic limit is a $0 copay. 
The partial subsidy eligible beneficiaries have an up to $83 um, deductible and that coinsurance to the initial coverage limit can be up to 15% per prescription. And then we have that generic above the catastrophic limit can be up to $3.35 per prescription. And then the other catastrophic limits can be up to $8.35 per prescription. <coughs> Excuse me, IRMA. So the Medicare Part D IRMA, this is a, <coughs> a really interesting, um, something that had been brought up to David and I. So basically this is the income related monthly adjustable amounts. So the Medicare Part D beneficiaries with higher incomes are going to pay a higher prescription drug monthly premium. What was that situation that was brought up to you, David? Well, a couple of them. Uh, one is the way they determine whether or not you're going to have Part D, Irma, is through a two-year look back. So two-year look back? Right. So if you had a higher income two years ago, even though your income is lower now, okay, they're looking at that two years ago. So and, if uh, I'm eligible for Medicare enrollment now, they're going to look at my taxes from two years ago? Two years back. And a couple of situations I ran across was one was uh, downsizing a home, you know, where they had sold it and preparing for retirement and going into Medicare and all that kind of stuff. Some of it wound up on their tax return. So they got stuck with paying a higher in, you know, uh, the income related monthly adjustment amount because their taxes two years ago were higher. Takes it two years to catch back up again to their current income, but uh, they get. Uh, they'll just have to pay those higher costs to tell them. And the other one was very similar, except instead of uh, selling a home, it was taking the uh, uh, early retirement where they uh, got a severance and wound up adding to their income. So just to clarify, if today I enrolled and my income was higher two years ago, I am going to be subject to a higher payment for that premium, but once that two-year period has been in past, then they're going to go based on my current situation. Well, it's current, but it's still looking two years back. Right? Okay, but <laughs> it is Medicare that is looking after that information? Right. It's Medicare that's doing it. The Part D carrier is collecting it. Okay. So enrollment periods, we have the ICEP, which is the initial coverage enrollment period, which is the seven month period, which is three months before the person is eligible, the month of their birth or the birth month, and then the three months after the first month of their eligibility. The AEP, which is the annual election period, which is October 15th through December 7th. This is where you get those people that are joining or they're switching because they've dropped out of a Medicare Advantage plan or the PPO, or potentially this could be the last plan that you sell that insured. Now keep in mind, any and all of the policies that you're writing from October 15th through December 7th are going to be effective January 1 under this AEP. And then special election periods. This is the situation outside of the ICEP or the AEP in which certain Medicare beneficiaries can enroll in an MA or Part D plan. So these are those persons that have moved out of the plan service area, losing employer group health coverage, that low income subsidy, whether or the Medicaid eligibility, whether they've lost it or they've obtained it newly, and then, of course, the uh, special needs plan eligibility. David and I are going to go into more, more detail at a later date on that. So keep we'll an a, eye out for we'll, it. We'll do a whole webinar just on sex. So let's talk about that uh, late enrollment penalty, David. Well, let me kind of break it down for you. Um, it's uh, equal to 1% of the national average for Part D premiums for every month in which he or she was delayed in their enrollment 
and remains in effect for as long as an enrollee has a Medicare Part D plan. Well, basically, uh, it's, uh, you just multiply 1%. Uh, 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 we'll go back to 2017, the average was $35.63. So that means for every month that one did not have a Medicare Part D plan, there would be a 36 cent penalty. So uh, if you only went for a, a year or two, I think we calculated out at two years, you're looking at uh, about $8.64 would be your penalty. But remember, you're gonna pay that for the rest of the time uh, you're in that Part D plan or any other Part D plan. So that's per month, per right? Per month, right? Oh. And only imagine if your if your uh, enrollee has gone 10 or 20 years without a Part D. I mean, you can more than triple the cost of some of those plans out there. So that's pretty much uh, Part D, and uh, you know, kind of the the do's and don'ts, and uh, and how it works. So if you do have any questions or if we can be of any any help for you, be sure to just send us an email at the training box. That is literally covered, uh, you know, pretty much uh, throughout the week. And then with it coming into open enrollment, we have been um, looking at the box and the questions over the weekend too, in some cases. Now, if you guys have questions or you don't know if this is the right coverage for your insured, don't hesitate. Email that box. David and I are here to help you and support you so you can focus on doing what you do best, which is selling, right, David? That's right. Don't let us be the, the back office and take care of some of that uh, extra load for you. All right, guys. So just, we're going to uh, sign off for now, and thank you for spending part of your day with us. We appreciate it. So we hope you have a good remainder of your day. Mm -hmm.